Alright, so uh, we are actually going to make some media today and then uh, we will, now yesterday we already did some inoculation, we already did some, uh, on Monday we kind of swapped some area and then on Tuesday we did that and then, um, no Monday we did that, okay. And then we swap some area, we let it grow, okay? So that's the idea. So you actually need to uh, incubate, that's the five eyes of microbiology, okay? So you need to inoculate, meaning uh, find a source, okay? Put a very small amount, okay? And then you need to put it into some media, okay? And then we did that on an agar plate. And then uh, it, you won't see the results right away. You have to grow it, okay? Usually overnight, okay? So uh, my, microorganisms grow pretty fast. You usually then you put an incubator, let it grow overnight, okay, and then the next day, you know, yesterday we look at the plates, there are lots of colonies already, right? Lots of bacteria growing on the plate. So that's the idea, okay? So inoculate, put a very small amount onto some fresh uh, media, onto either agar or liquid media, let it grow, incubate overnight, and then you can do some isolation, inspection, and identification. We just didn't do that yesterday, we throw a red plate, but then you can I would, we were able to identify some colonies, okay? So I pointed to you some of those are fungus, some of those are bacteria, okay? So these are the five eyes of microbiology, okay? So, uh, so you almost always have to do that, okay? So you, you isolate a sample from, uh, you know, the skin or, or a urine sample or whatever sample you get from the patient. You put it in some media, you have to let it grow first, okay? You typically won't see your results right away, okay? But, all right, so, uh, and then you can do some isolation inspection. Okay, so which is what we already we've already done that. Okay, which is kind of uh, fun. You put a small amount, put into some media, let it grow, and then you can uh, incubate, and then you see the results. Okay, so all right. So uh, now we will be doing a lot of that these kind of experiments throughout our labs. Okay, so this is just a basic concept. Okay, so let's talk about some of the media that we are going to use. Okay, so uh, culture is a propagation of microorganisms in various types of media. So uh, media is usually the nutrient stuff that we put in, okay? We put it on agar plates, that's the type of media. You can just put it in some liquid media. Uh, and then uh, bacteria, uh, a lot of microorganisms like to grow in um, liquid media as well. So inoculation is putting a very small amount into the uh, culture media. All right, so uh, these are the common samples that you get from clinical samples, okay? So blood cultures, CSF culture, okay? So uh, sputum from uh, people like say may have TB or something or other respiratory infections and then urine feces some, sometimes disease tissues okay or you do certain swaps in certain areas okay so uh, skin swaps or uh, or different places okay so uh, then you get your uh, then you inoculate it into some media all right so incubation typically you set the uh, incubator around 37 degrees celsius that's like the one that we have in uh, the lab so this is our physiological temperature so uh, that uh, just simulates uh, just it, uh, uh, the physiological temperature and then uh, microorganisms usually grow better at a warmer temperature and then uh, sometimes you may have to adjust the o2 and co2 level okay so uh, uh, this is because uh, some of the microorganisms uh, inside your body uh, because there's actually a lot more CO2 inside our body compared with the atmosphere and uh, does anybody remember the CO2 level inside our body? What's the percentage of CO2 that you breathe out from your lungs? How many percent of your exhaled air is CO2? 190. Say it again. 90 percent. It would be that high, no? 70. No. 70 percent of air is nitrogen. <laughs> so seventy eight percent of air is nitrogen. Forty percent. It's still mostly nitrogen. What you breathe out is only about five percent. Okay, so what? the air that you breathe out is only about five percent CO two. Okay, which is already a lot higher than the atmosphere. The atmosphere is zero point zero four percent. So uh, the amount of CO two in the atmosphere is about zero point zero four percent. Okay, it's a lot higher than uh, in the exhaled air. Okay, so and then. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, because there's not a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere and there's a lot more CO2 in your body, some organisms actually like more CO2. So occasionally uh, you have to, some organisms will only grow best when you put it uh, in a in rich CO2 environment. Okay, so that's some of the things you typically see in, in labs. 
Uh, now, also some organisms don't like oxygen. Okay, for example, the ox the organism growing in your in your gut. Okay, so they actually don't like oxygen. Your gut is an entirely anaerobic environment. So when you do <laughs> like a feces culture, you typically have to grow it in an anaerobic environment. Okay, so to actually allow the anaerobic organisms to grow, in order to correctly identify what the patients may have. Okay, so. Uh, and then because a lot of your intestinal bacteria will not grow in the presence of oxygen. All right, so during the incubation, microbes grow, multiply, and produce visible growth media. Okay, so you then you can look at it in the media. All right, so here are some of the things that you, you may see. We already saw a lot of dots yesterday, okay? So remember we spread the, the, the tubes out, we see one, these little dots. Okay? So what you can actually assume is that when you see a dot, okay, when you see a, uh, a dot, that's called a colony. Okay, so uh, so when you spread it out and you see actually one little dot appearing on a, on a, on a one area of an agar, this one single dot actually originally come from one single bacteria. Okay, so what happened is when you spread it out, you spread it so thin that one single bacterium ended up landing on this uh, portion of the agar, and then when you grow it overnight, the bacteria multiplies and then pile on top of itself, forming a colony. Okay, so uh, when you see a dot you actually can assume that this originally come from one single colony, one single bacteria. Okay. So it just formed a colony after you've incubated it. Okay, so uh, this is called a, uh, a colony. Okay, so. And uh, you can, this is why if you started with a mixture of two different kinds, when you spread it out thin enough, you can see here, you can actually separate uh, two different kinds of, uh, of the bacteria when you spread it out like that. Okay, if you see a red one, if you see a white one and a yellow one, then they actually become because you physically separated them, uh, but they grow and pile on top of yourself overnight, and then you can then actually just separate them, and you can get a pure culture back afterwards. Okay, so uh, all right. So this is what we should uh, know whenever you uh, we look at a colony like that. Okay, so you actually actually can assume that this one single bacterium, this single this colony, originally come from one single bacterium. All right, so uh, now you can also do liquid culture. So we look at plates yesterday. Today we're going to mix some liquid media. And uh, liquid media is just uh, some, some broth in a tube, okay? So the broth contains nutrients that the bacteria would like to grow. And then you just put a small amount into the, these uh, liquid, and then you can start growing. And then uh, you can also do semi-solid, okay? So we did solid, and then uh, you can do semi-solid. Uh, we will be doing this actually when we are doing uh, when we do our lab. Okay, semi-solid. They are like uh, uh, like some um, uh, uh, like you know, they would solidify at a lower temperature, but they allow the bacteria to actually swim through the media. Uh, this is actually a motility test. Okay, we will be doing this in our lab too. So when you put the bacteria in the middle, if the bacteria can swim, they actually spread throughout the the semi-solid. If the bacteria cannot swim, they are restricted to the roof. Okay, so this is a, a, a way to tell if a bacteria can swim. All right, so uh, now the agar that we that we uh, used yesterday comes from algae. Okay, so it's a complex polysaccharide that comes from algae. Uh, when you boil it, it uh, liquefies, kind of just like gelatin. Okay, kind of like jello or gelatin or jelly. Okay, so uh, it liquefies when you boil it, and then uh, but then when you cool it, it becomes solid media. And uh, it's flexible, moldable, it holds moisture. Now, the bacteria actually generally don't eat the, the agar, okay? But it, uh, it actually just absorbs the nutrients that it dissolved in the agar, okay? So this is what uh, the uh, gelatin is for, okay? So you can actually use gelatin, okay? So uh, do you know where gelatin, what gelatin comes from? Does anybody know? Sorry? It comes from tendons of either cows or, 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 uh, or um, chicken or, um, or pigs, okay? So it's tendons of uh, animals, okay? So, so you think eating jello is vegetarian, you cannot be more wrong. Okay? So, <laughs> does anybody think jello is a vegetarian? No, it is so not vegetarian, okay? It is completely animal, okay? It is completely, that's the gelatin, okay? So, uh, all right, so uh, you, you can use gelatin. There are, uh, in the, some labs would use uh, gelatin to uh, culture, uh, to culture uh, bacteria. All right, so uh, yeah, so this is the agar. Okay, so now with uh, agar, you uh, you can sometimes put chemically defined and sometimes more complex media. We we'll take a look at some examples. 
So uh, chemically defined media, this is typically what you need to put in in order for bacteria to grow properly. You do have to put in some amino acids. All right, so uh, you have to have some nitrogen source, okay? So, uh, and you typically also put in some uh, uh, glucose, okay? So as a fuel, okay, you also put in some, you need to put in some of these ions as well, okay? So vitamins, salts, like that. So you typically have to put in something that, so that the bacteria will grow properly, okay? So most bacteria are not photosynthetic. They don't like make their own, uh, they actually need to absorb the nutrients on those agar plates. So you can see here, these are the stuff that you need to put in. Now, uh, but sometimes some bacteria require something that isn't completely chemically defined. Uh, some bacteria you should, some bacteria may only grow when you add these kind of things like, you know, 27.5 grams of brain, heart, and peptone extract. All right, so uh, when you add something like these, okay, brain, add, brain extract, heart extract, something like that, these are called complex media because you don't exactly know what you're putting into the media. You just know that you put some brain tissue in there, okay? So uh, uh, so some bacteria would only grow when you put into these complex media, okay? So, so th th these are complex media. This would be called chemically defined media, right? So, all right, so uh, now you can make your media selective. We're, we're doing quite a, quite a number of these examples. Selective me media means some, uh, there's some substance that you put in that inhibits the growth of certain microbes but not others, okay? So uh, important in isolation of specific types of microbes. So we'll be doing quite a bit of those experiments as we go along with the labs, okay? So I actually won't ask you questions in this chapter over here, okay? So it's just to show you a concept. Differential media means the, uh, you put multiple different types of organisms may show a different color, may show a different visible outcome when you put them on uh, agar plates, okay? So uh, this is just the example. So. Um, Differential media means different bacteria may show up different color, and then uh, whereas uh, where selective media means it only allows certain bacteria to grow in certain and type other bacteria may not grow. Okay, so all right, so now let's uh, now occasionally you do have to grow. We were just uh, just talking about that. You do have to put something called reducing media, meaning no oxygen, and then uh, this is actually quite essential, especially for culturing. Uh, bacteria coming in your intestine uh, to accurately see if the patient has a certain uh, anaerobic bacterial diseases, you actually do have to put your culture in an anaerobic environment, okay? So something that actually absorbs the oxygen. Uh, we will be playing with a lot of carbon carbohydrate fermentation meaning, okay? So we'll talk more about this when we uh, actually do that. All right, so uh, now we already kind of discussed the isolation. We streaked it and then you have one single bacterium landing on place on certain part of the agar, it, it would grow overnight, pile on top of itself, forming a visible colony. All right, so we will actually be doing this too, so you don't need to worry about this. Just an illustration of concept, because we actually will be doing a lot of these experiments as we move along. Actually, let's actually move on to uh, microscope and then metric measurements, okay, which is also very important. Uh, we will discuss uh, metric measurements, uh, and then we will talk about different types of microscopes. And then, because uh, we just started looking at the microscope yesterday, and uh, I will give you a very quick review of metric measurements too. So something that you should have learned in Bio 101. Okay, so uh, uh, now metric is the unit that everybody uses. The whole world uses metric. Okay, so America is the only country left in the world that still doesn't use metric. Right, so so that actually means you should learn metric. Okay, so. If you go to Europe, um, all the units, are, you know, all the distance are expressed in kilogram, you know, uh, nobody speaks of inches, nobody speaks of feet, okay, so England, they still use feet and stones and things like that, but, uh, uh, but most people still know metric, okay, so anyway, so uh, now metric actually has a very scientific definition, okay, so we'll uh, start from the beginning, so a meter is actually originally defined as one, one, million of a quadrant of the Earth, okay? So this is the original definition of the meter. Uh, the f some French scientists made this measurement in 1895. I didn't know how, okay? So they didn't have satellites then. There were no, now there's GPS and you can measure things very accurately, but uh, but uh, I have no idea how they actually did it in 1895, okay? Anyway, the, the original definition of, me of meter actually comes from 
the, the, the uh, circumference of the Earth. Okay, therefore, the shortest distance between the equator and the North Pole is exactly 10 million meters, or 10,000 kilometers. Okay, so this is the exact uh, distance of uh, meters. So if somebody asks you how big is the Earth, you should be able to answer is 40 million meters or 40,000 kilometers. Okay, so if somebody asks you how big is this planet Earth, you can precisely answer is 40,000 kilometers in circumference. Okay, so not a meter more, not a meter less. Okay, so uh, so this actually comes from the uh, 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 the meter comes from the, the from the circumference of the Earth. All right, so this is the definition of meter. So after a meter is uh, defined, okay, so a scientist built uh, used a meter to create a volume unit. Okay, so when you build a box that is these dimension, okay, 100 millimeters or 10 centimeters. 0.1 meters, okay, so these three are actually equivalent, we'll talk about these in just a moment. So if you have a box with 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters, if you build a box like that, all right, you feel that uh, this is called one liter, okay, the one liter is actually defined out of uh, a cubic box, all right, so one liter is a box of these dimensions, okay, so 0.1 meter times 0.1 meter times 0.1 meter, or 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters, or 100 millimeters times 100 millimeters, 100 millimeters. Okay, so these three are equivalent. Right, so this is one liter. Now, after uh, a liter was defined, and then uh, scientists need a convenient weight standard. All right, so the most convenient weight standard actually will come from water. So I decided to say, why don't you just fill this box with water? This is if you fill the one liter box with water, the weight of the water inside the box is exactly one kilogram. Okay, so uh, uh, you might have remember when you study bio 101, um, you know, one liter of water weighs approximately one kilogram. Okay, this is not a coincidence, it is the very definition of the kilogram. Okay, so uh, so you can actually create your own weight standard. Okay, you don't have to buy a standard kilogram from you know a uh, uh, from some company, okay? The pound, they actually have to buy a standard pound from somewhere, okay, to calibrate the scale. If you want to create your kilogram standard, just fill up the, a liter box with your, uh, with uh, water. That is your kilogram standard, okay? So, so the weight of exactly one a liter of water would be one kilogram, or one milliliter of uh, water weighs exactly one gram, okay? So, uh, a kilogram is defined as the weight of one liter of pure water at room temperature, okay, so which is, uh, which is most of the time is room temperature. All right, so these are the original definition of metric units, okay, you can see here it actually comes from uh, some convenient um, uh, things that we can actually just, you can reproduce yourself, okay, so once you have a meter ruler, you can actually build these things yourself. All right, so that is the uh, metric measurements, okay? So uh, now you do need to know a couple metric prefixes, okay? So these prefixes are universal, right? So not just to weight or volume or length units, okay? Uh, this applies to computer language too, okay? Petter, giga, mega, kilo, okay? So those are the big units. And in microbiology, in this class, you absolutely need to know these three, milli, micro, and nano, right? So, uh, they're not confusing if you uh, just know uh, what they are. So, I mean, the M and the N, okay? So you do have to know that if you made a mistake and changed it from M to N, you change from M to a nano, uh, which is a very, very big difference, All right? So let's start with the smaller units, and then we'll go back to the bigger units, okay? So the smaller units in, uh, that we need to, that we will use in microbiology, when we talk about, uh, say, the length of a cell and distances, will be milli, micro, and nano, okay? Mini is 1,000, okay? 10 to the power minus 3, or 1 over 1,000, like 0 0.001, right? So micro is 10 to the power minus 6, 1 millionth, okay? 0, 6, the 6 decimal place, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then a nano is actually quite a bit smaller, 10 to the power minus 9, that's a millionth. Or 0 0.00000001. Okay, so this is, um, uh, yeah, so you uh, sh definitely should not confuse these units, milli, micro, and a nano. A milli is actually a thousand times bigger than a micro, micro is another thousand times bigger than a nano. 
right, so, uh, so a milli is how many times bigger than a nano then? If I go from a milli, this is a thousand times bigger than this, this is a thousand times bigger than this. So this is how many?